And now for an exploring interview. Stay tuned. Welcome to an Explore Minute Interview Podcast. I am your host, Rob. And joining me today is my co-host, Ben. Welcome, Ben. How's it going, Rob? It's going well, man. We've never actually done this whole visual recording thing. It's messed me up a little bit. How are you? <laughs> I'm pretty good. Are you surprised by my beard? <laughs> it's it's epic. It's really great. I like it. Today we have a... It's a mighty beard. I, I have... I would never... My son can do a beard like that almost, but not me. I get the I get I'd be able to do it. I'd only be a pure neck beard. <laughs> well, well, he's the wizard look. I've been playing a lot of Fantasy Four X, so I'm kind of going for this for this wizard look. But I'm going. I've got this kind of like gray streak that's started appearing in it now because it just I'm means like, you I'm, have magic. That's it, how it, it does. Or yeah. it just means I'm an old bugger. <laughs> well, he's out of himself. He's here, Brad Wardell, the CEO of Stardock. Welcome to the show. Hey, good to see you guys. Good to see you and good to talk to you. So, well, I guess we're here for, what is it now? Uh, Galactic Civilizations 4. That's right. We're here to talk about this. Right. Yeah, what an amazing announcement. And I, I, I don't even know where to begin, to be honest, Brad, because there's just so much to talk about. And I was kind of hoping you could at least give us like a foundation, sort of like the underlying reason as to why Galactic 4 was your next project and what you wanted to accomplish with it. Yeah, I mean, I've been wanting to do Gauss of 4 since well, before Gauss of 3 came out. So, I mean, you know a little bit of my background. I was just talking about that. that I have not been the kindest uh, person with regards to Galactic Civilization 3. Some of the people on your subreddit, you think they, they think they're rough on Gauss of 3. I'm like, ah! Um, but well, we can get into that. But essentially, I wanted to get – I wanted my – Designed for Gauss of three to be made, which was which is what Gauss of four is heavily uh, influenced by, and uh, so you know, the, you know, as soon as uh, you know, we got to the point where we we got Gauss of three into what we think is a pretty good state. I mean, you did your uh, re-review, and I, I I agreed with everything but the tactical battles because you're you're insane, <laughs> but um, the. You know, but it is it, we had taken it about as far as it could. So I mean, it's one of those things where you read the the forums or whatever, and they basically come out. It's always the same thing. Galaxy Three came out. It was disappointing to a lot of people when it first came out. Stardock then uh, made it a lot better. At least it wasn't buggy. It was just it was what we call streamlined uh, when it first came out, and then we uh, greatly improved it. And then it had reached a point where it's it's a pretty good game, but it's time to to move on to the to something where we can start from scratch, not code wise, but not engine wise, but you know, from be able to implement a new design to it. Well, right. I, maybe you could. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Me, <laughs> uh, Brad. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about the the series history. Um, like, who are you as a gamer, and what what was your first game that kind of got you into the genre? And you know, because sure. I'm interested. I'm interested to know. I gather that that Galaxy have kind of developed from from your love of games right <laughs> yeah well the year is 1990 you know 1990 <laughs> and i'm a big civilization player and i was in college and uh who's that wait what are you rob what is that um i was eight you were eight <laughs> oh you're hurting you are hurting me um and uh so i i, I and i've told this story to sid meyer when i uh I, i've had lunch with him and i actually told him the story he you know he's from ann arbor which is just down the road from here. Oh. And, uh, but it, it give you how naive everyone, this story sounds incredibly naive because it was a different, remember we didn't have really internet back then. So all this naivete would never happen today. So I wanted to find out, well, what happens when the ship in civilization leaves, right? The ship at the end of Civ, it's like, you know, it goes off. And I wanted that game because I ever loved civilization. So I said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll make my own. I mean, I'm in college and, how hard can it be? I don't know how to 
you know, program or anything, but I, was just, I bought a book, uh, Teach Yourself C in 21 Days, and then I made the game, and I will call it, well, I'll, I'll call it uh, uh, civiliz- Galactic Civilizations. You know, because, and, and uh, can you imagine someone doing that today? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so again, this is 1993. So there was no master ride or anything yet uh, when this was happening. And I wrote it for OS2 because I, I really wanted to have the AI be really good. That was the thing that was motivated me to write the game. Um, was I wanted the AI to be able to have the time to calculate its strategy, the background, which means I needed a multi-threaded operating system. So that was the first one. That was just basically uh, me. I got some programming help from uh, one of my friends and uh, some art uh, from my, uh, my not my roommate, but basically a guy down the hall in the dorms did the, so that's where the original Drenjin and, and Archeans and all them came from. Yeah. So it, that was the very first one back then. I remember playing it actually. I remember thinking, oh, okay, cool. There's, there's a new Space Forex game, and I really enjoyed it. But you could only play as the humans back then. Yes. Oh, yeah. I couldn't I mean, you couldn't imagine play, what, playing as an alien. Who'd want to t- do that? And it turns out, by the way, statistically, that's no one wants to play as aliens. I know that the people on the line, you'd think that they were. it was so important. But we got the stats, and it's like 70% of players have never played as anything. Now, I'm not talking custom humans either. I'm just talking they've never played but the stock Karen Alliance. It it hurts. <laughs> well, all that effort you put into those alien races, eh? <laughs> yeah. Well, that was actually a point we brought up last week when we were talking about Age of Wonders Planetfall, Brad. And we were talking about just how I, I personally like really alien races, right? I like the exotic things, the you know, the weird stuff. And I like playing as that kind of thing. And we were talking about how Age of Wonders Planetfall chose to go with a bunch of different human races that kind of look different. And I brought that statistic up because I remember you said on the forums or something like that, that Galactic, like the vast majority of people who play Galactic Civilizations play as the humans and don't ever go away from that. And when 70% figure doesn't mean they're playing humans 70% of the time. I mean, 70% of the players have never even one time tried anything but the Terran Alliance. They haven't even like customized the Terran Alliance. It's That's got a nasty like, knock-on effect as well, you know, because often in often in these games, the human faction are often the sort of vanilla faction, and that kind of makes them, you know, it sometimes makes them a little boring, and it can throw people as well, because I don't know, are you aware of the game Stars in Shadow? But that one has the human faction as a, they were, they were actually really hard to play because they've got different mechanics. They, st- they don't start out with a colony, so you have like, you know, you, you kind of, you start out with a real disadvantage because you don't actually have a, ci- uh, a city at the start. So um, you get people complaining like the, the game's too hard. And it's like, are you playing with the humans? Yes. Well, they're the hard faction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I admit in StarCraft, I only play as the humans. I never play as a Zerg or a Protoss. I mean, I know how to play. I have played as those. Uh, you know, like it's, you know how I feel about the Protoss. I mean, they're the <laughs> tutorial race for losers. <laughs> but... <laughs> Well, and you know, that brings up my point. My next point is that I, I actually never play as the humans. I just don't. I don't feel like the humans just feel so boring to me. You know, playing. Starcraft or Galsip? In anything. I, I, <sighs> the Terrans, I've never played the Terrans in Starcraft. I've never played the Ter- the humans in Galactic Civilizations. I just, I've never done It's just never been. Well, what do you play as in Starcraft? I, don't it, say it. Don't yeah. say it. I don't know what you, I'm, now I'm about to say, I don't know, I'm afraid You're, to say. Do not say Protoss. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, I, I like the Junjun because I really like to be war focused, you know, I, or I like the Iconians because I, I like the weird like space religion stuff they do, you know, I, any of them that are just out of, you know, out of the ordinary to me are exciting, not, not well, the you're other gonna stuff. Well, you're going to like Galaxy 4 because uh, one of our mantras is that I don't, we don't, I don't care that much about balance anymore. Like, I like to hear so, that. So, like, so one of the races, they, their home solar system starts colonized. Oh, but if they have an advantage. I don't care. I, I don't care. You have a problem with it, don't put them in your game. <laughs> <laughs> or lower their difficulty. Well, okay, so now that brings up my next point, right? And I, I really wanted to know more about the like basic gameplay loop now. Because from what you've been telling me and what was kind of you know relayed to us on the forums and through Discord is that you start off with what is like your core worlds, right? And then you, you, 
branch out, you colonize a bunch of new ones, and they're kind of just feeder colonies, right? So can you tell me more about that that gameplay mechanic? Yeah, so in Galactic Civilization 3, there's this kind of mechanic that it's not, it's kind of similar, uh, where you could get make asteroid mines, right? And then their, res- their raw materials would go to your home planet, you know, to its associated planet. And that was, I mean, they were kind of boring because you just clicked on and paid money. Uh, but um, I don't like that mechanic. But uh, I don't like the idea of just clicking on a thing and, and spending money and having it. It's just, it, there's no planning for that. I, if I can hit it, it but I, I digress. In Galaxy 4, so you let's say you start out with Earth. And that's your core. I would call Earth a core world, right? And so when you colonize, say, Mars and, and or you go in other star systems and you're colonizing, by default, they're just colonies, right? And they don't just pump raw resources. Every planet pumps out either, uh, pumps out a combination of tech, uh, wealth, and minerals to your, to your home world and food uh, to your home world. And then uh, what your home world, your core, that core world does is that, you know, you build the stuff on the planet and you have citizens and stuff that do stuff to it to magnify it based on your strategy. So if you can picture that. Now, down the line, the more planets that feed into a core world, the more uh, what we call decay starts to happen from just corruption and stuff, right? Because obviously someone's going to sit out there and go, well, I'll have 500 planets feeding my core world. And it'll just be the, the god planet, right? And it, it that is certainly a strategy. You want to talk about playing tall, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's like, that's tall. Uh, but you, then you're fighting, and that's a viable strategy. But, of course, then you're going to be putting your effort into re- reducing the decay, the the corruption and the crime and all the other stuff that comes in part when you have a, va- a basically the most centralized government you can imagine, right? Um, so you can hire leader. If you want to control a planet directly, you want to be able to actually give it orders and stuff. You then put a leader in charge of it. So you can recruit a leader, and the leader you can, at the beginning, beginning of the game, all the leaders you can recruit are your species, because you don't know about the others. But down the line, as you have relations with other civs, you will be able to recruit leaders of other species. And you put, they, each one has their, each of these leaders has their own stats. So if you've ever played a Crusader Kings game, you can imagine the, the, how they have stats. They also have a backstory, which in hindsight was, an, it's kind of like, duh, we should have, um, that's such. I love this feature because they have a backstory and they have a ship, and their backstory kind of tells you what kind of quest might possibly spin out. We don't call them quests, of course, but uh, might spin out from these guys. But anyway, you hire one, and there's a lot of things you can do with one of these leaders, right? They don't. You don't just. It's not like Galsib where you get a a citizen every ten turns. You have to you have to recruit these guys, um, and then you can decide where you're going to put them. One of the things you can do is make them in charge of a planet. And if you make them in charge of the planet, now you can decide. Now you can go to that planet and start ordering what's going to be built there. So it's kind of the opposite, right? Where you, in a lot of games you put a governor in charge of a planet to run it for you. This is just the opposite, right? Because you have to put the governor there in order for you to do it. And then that planet will have a bunch of planet, uh, colonies that feed it. Go ahead. So Brad, um, in your article that you you wrote for Explominate, you were saying how you really don't like anything automated in these games, and I I've heard this. I've heard. Well, I don't like the choice, this. right? Yeah, either yeah. either always make it this way. Don't make it where I'm being I I'm being punished if I don't manually do it, right? Because that's just yeah. no fun. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I mean, this seems like it's kind of going the other direction. Then you're rather than have these AI governors, you're actually um are you unable to control the planet in any way then if you don't have a leader um oh what all control? the plan all this it is it's just dumping the resources to its resources to your to its corresponding uh core world so okay. it does there's nothing to control right um there are certain things you can do when you get later text you can upgrade the planet so imagine you're clicking on a planet the ui is so much better too but you click on a planet and there's like a you know upgrade button and that will basically boost it but that's as far as it goes. Okay. Well, and there's also other things that you can assign these these characters to, right? Like I, from what I've seen, some of the screenshots you see, like ministers of finance, ministers of defense, and stuff like that. Now, how are they playing a role in those in those positions? Yeah. So you put them uh, like uh, minister. Call, call them to say every ministry has 
various special powers it gives your civilization and how good those powers are are based on the stats of the governor. So let's say you have a minister of technology. Uh, you put your, uh, you put a, sorry, I shouldn't call it governor. You put your leader on that and you get an X percent boost to your research speed based on the intelligence of that leader. Yeah, no, that's cool. And you mentioned, okay, we're, we're not getting our leaders every 10 turns like we did in Galactic Civilizations 3. How, how are they presenting themselves? Are they just, you know, every once in a while you're getting a story event or something like that that shows up or? Well, you, there's literally a recruit screen and then you have a new concept entirely, which again is another uh, hindsight obvious. Uh, why didn't we think of this before? We have a concept called executive orders. So you can go to your executive order screen it's, it's so at the bottom of the screen, there's a, you know there's these icons that you you press the button that brings up the screen, and under executive orders, one of the things you can do is is recruit uh, basically try to recruit leaders. So you you spend what are a new resource called control on this. So you can get there basically your control is the resource that allows you to directly do stuff to the world. So rather than um, let me give you an example, well, I'll get into that in a second. So one of the things you can do is recruit leaders and then leaders will start showing up and they only should stay for a certain amount of period. They'll actually tell you how many turns they're sticking around for until they leave because leaders cost money. So you're like, you can't just sit there and like, well, and I'll get to them at some point in the future. It's like, yeah, you kind of have to do it in seven turns or this guy's or whatever, you know, some are there for a long time. Some aren't there long at all. And like I said, almost all of them have some sort of negative and positive perk. And by negative, you mean sometimes like they have, I mean, I saw one has like an addiction or something like that. And I guess that would probably have create some sort of issue, right? Or they're corrupt or they're disloyal. I mean, one of, the, one of my favorite things in games is when, you know, like I want to have, I was just talking on the discord. It's like, I'd like that prisons in this game somehow, <laughs> right? Where you, you, or, or whatever you want to call them for taking prisoners. When you get other people's le leaders and you want to do stuff to them. Hey, that's a little ghoulish, but um that's like crusader kings right yeah you do or your torture oh you know i mean just castrating i mean what you know it's humane <laughs> yeah, but how do you yeah, castrate but, a mantis like I, whatever that, that there was like a you know well that's a thing you could have race specific tortures <laughs> right so you could be like in that rick and morty episode where it's like he says half now and half when you finish <laughs> and I'm like wait i thought we were torturing him yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> it's so great. Well, speaking of that, I do want to digress quickly because I did. I have seen quite a bit of race, new races, right? So, I, I what is that? Are we, what are you guys going with that? Are you trying to add a bunch of new races to the existing races? Are you trying to kind of wipe the slate clean and start with a whole new fresh cast? We're gonna have the old races in, except for, of course, the uh, Thalen. They left. They're gone. Um, they will come back. We have this other concept called Galactic Achievements. They're kind of like. Uh, a lot of our thoughts going into start. One of my problems with these games, these four, four, with four X games, is that after round turn hundred, two turn two hundred, they're so bo a lot of them are really boring, and you kind of have to you because you know you're going to win or you're going to lose, but usually it's, you're going to win, and it's like uh, I don't do that. so we have these galactic achievements in there, and so that we will probably have the Thalen back for one of these galactic achievements, like deal with the Thalen and you click on it to start that achievement and then it spawns the Thalen and they start doing stuff. Basically stuff to screw. They're basically a bunch of things to screw up your game. Um, but yeah, the, we'll have all but the Thalen will back and then we're going to have um, a bunch of new ones. I, I love them too. Some of them look really great. I, I, the, the ones you've shown, like there's this one like little cute race and then, and there's the uh, what was the one that stood out? The, the plants. I'm I'm a big plant fa race fan. So to see plants, how uh, you got me there? Finally, yeah. <laughs> Finally, they get the plants get to shine. <laughs> yeah. The the basic rule is I don't want to see humanoids. That's basically the mantra. I I I don't have a problem with humanoids except when they're all humanoids. And I'm coming from Gauss of three. It's like they're they're all humanoids. It seems I think they're all. I think they actually are all humanoids. And um. I was like, so the mantra for Gaussian 4 is like, no, you can, I want lots of races. I don't want to see a bunch of humanoids. Are you recycling any of the races from Gaussian 3 at all? Um, I mean, obviously you've got the, the series all of staples like the Drengen and Yeah, I mean, all but the Thalen we want to bring back. Yeah. I mean, there will be new graphics and stuff. I mean, it's, 
you know, graphics improves in, in the last six years, so we'll bring that forward. And we got really good making aliens in Star Control, right? So we want to bring some of those techniques up. Because Galaxy 3 was done pre-Star Control, and man, we, are, we upped our game during that project. Well, yeah, and that was what I was going to say, is that I felt like the race design, the faction design, has clearly taken some inspiration from Star Control. And I thought that when you guys... Same people. <laughs> yeah, oh, good. So, But it, it seemed like, too, that once you actually brought in some of the Star Control races into Galactic Civilization, it started to feel a little bit more alien. They just didn't feel like... For me personally, it didn't feel like it fit into the universe because, of course, I'd play Star Control, and then it kind of felt like these, like... Interlopers were well, like... they clashed, right? It clashed. Yeah. So now the Star Control races won't be in Galsip 4 because they're not canon. That was just a, a DLC. But the, uh, you know, all the new races are going to be up, to, you know, upgraded to be a lot more interesting. And it's kind of th interesting. Remember that every race we do has to have their own set of citizens, right? Because I don't want all my people to look the same. So, you know, you're when you're capturing that leader you're playing as the archians and you have already these archian leaders they all have to you know they have to look different right yeah that's humans what... are so much easier to do now because they have ai you know, there's a, those ai things you see now where they don't actually generate faces but no such thing for the drengen yet <laughs> well maybe one day <laughs> yeah no i can imagine that's a lot of artwork to be done i mean that's that's i mean from what i saw you said like just i'll dozens of leaders dozens of different portraits for each race so you're talking about a lot of artwork yeah well i just feel like well that's kind of the big thing has changed right since uh we were talking about that before and on on in the article is that our industry has changed the game gamers have really changed in terms of what uh what we want right we we're a long way from do this and get plus one whatever it's like no 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 do this i get this trait called whatever and that trait does stuff but i don't want to simply go and research a thing and get plus one you know something you know this this citizen gives you plus one and you know uh, research points what well, why i why you know immersion matters yeah 100 percent. that's something i've harped on for some time now so it's it's good to hear well i wanted to go back to gameplay for a second and i can tell very clearly that the scope of galactic civilization is far four is far greater so we're talking about just giant galaxies and you're controlling like small like medium-sized maps is what you described them as and what would have, would have, would have been medium-sized maps in galactic civilization 3 and you're controlling like a lot of those and you're you know there's a grander scale to all of that yeah, well, and a player has control. So, I mean, I don't want someone to think that they have to play some something that's going to take them three months to play. Um, I mean, you could have one sector, <laughs> right, and call it a day. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, now you're setting up, well, how many sectors do I want? You know, how big is my galaxy? And how big, do, you know, what variance do I want on my, uh, how big do I want these sectors to get? And then you just, they're kind of like two things. And, uh yeah, you can imagine that a on the larger side, a a sector could be as big as a medium Gaussian map. And are there bonuses to to basically kind of controlling a sector? Exactly. So the cool thing about these sectors is that every sector has its own bo set of bonuses for controlling it. So it's kind of like you're taking your you know your planet. Oh, this planet! If you own this planet, you get da 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 for your civilization. Well, now that you take it the next step, well, well, this sector, if you are and, and owning a sector, just means you have the most influence in that sector. So that's a. It's one of those things where it's not like you know tradition in these games, like oh, well, whoever has the biggest military is who wins the game. Like. Ah. Oh, well, you know, influence is now important because you can, you own, it's purely influence that determines who owns the sector. And so, and there's going to be sectors where there's really nothing worthwhile. So you just go and get the influence in that sector. And there might be, because you might have a sector that has basically, you know, bupkis of value in it. But if you own a sector, you get these extra goodies because you own a sector, which gives you an advantage. So Brad, you're talking about there's different ways to win in 4x games generally right and there's there's often this discussion well they always around. claim there's multiple ways and then everyone right. wins through one way we always have this big argument on a, on the explore minute discord about how you know whether 4x games just kind of boil down to war and um you've spoken in the past that you really it seems to me that you really lean into the idea that 4x games should have multiple victory conditions and different ways to approach victory um does this kind of 
how does Galsiv Four approach that? You know, are you are you leaning into that still? Yes and no. So I'm moving towards. I still I don't have a problem with having like distinct victory conditions like that. What I don't like is like in Galsiv Three. Actually, I'd say it's easiest to win just by allying with everyone. Um, but a lot of these victory conditions happen. Well, and, and it doesn't matter. This is not just a Gaussian problem. This is a problem with 4X games at this point. And that is, you already know how it's going to win. You're going you're gonna to win. So then you're just deciding, well, which of the various game mechanics or end game things is the quickest for me to win by? Is it winning by diplomacy or is it influence or is conquest quicker? What tools and and well, that's not fun. It's just like, well, what's the least painful way to end the game? So what we're looking at in Gauss of Four is a new type, which is prestige, which is basically so you still can win through the other means, okay? But a lot of time, like the problem is that I don't want to have to win a game by min maxing something, right? Because that's what you're really doing when you're winning a one of those victory conditions. I'm min maxing war. I'm what well, if I'm just winning? And I'm going to win the game. My view is that if I'm going to, if it's turn 200 and I'm going to win, then the game is already over. End the game. And that's where this prestige uh, new uh, victory path called prestige comes in. And that is where various things in the game can give you prestige. And if you have enough prestige, you'll win the game. And that's where early access comes in. Because how much prestige should that be? Well, I don't know. But... Ideally, it's enough prestige so that when it's pretty damn obvious you're going to win the game, it may take you another hundred turns of of tedium. I don't want to. I just want to skip the hundred turns of tedium and reward the player for winning the game. Then that sounds great. So they can move on to another game, up the difficulty level, change stuff, or what have you. Yeah, no, that sounds amazing because there. I mean, I think this is a long-standing thing that we talk about for. I mean, as long as Explorer has been around, probably as long as Forex Gaming has been around, it's just that the like the mid to late game just gets so, so sloggy, so boring. And, you know, you, you, like you said, there's a point at which you know you're winning and you just have to like kind of keep pushing next turn or whatever. And it just gets really, really bad. So I'm glad Some to hear you're addressing that. Though. Some games do avoid that. And it's but it's just really difficult putting your finger on what it is exactly that make those games less you know less drudgery in the in the mid and, and end game like stellaris is terrible for it it's it's it ruins that game completely the the mid game, the end game? End game drive yeah I, I think it's i never i think i've only ever finished one game of stellaris and it's it's just it's just really dull whereas there are other games like distant world's universe i find quite interesting right to the end it can become a little bit overwhelming in a different sense but it's never boring All um right. so i think that it's i've always found it really difficult to kind of put my finger on what it is that makes the, the more successful 4X games, if you're talking about finishing a game, what makes them distinct from the others? It, it's They know... And I have yet to play one where I've, I'm happy with the end game, but Distant Worlds Universe probably comes closest. Um, I, more people should play that game, by the way. And they're, by the way, they're making a sequel, you know, so people should be uh, going to Steam and wishlisting it right now. Get out, quit, go, go do it now. Um, hours. Yeah. Uh, but the, uh, the thing is, is that it's, you just, it's, you want the game to end just as, just as you're realizing you're going to win, but not too much longer, but not, not, and not too much longer than that and not before. And that just takes playability. It's, that's why this prestige thing, we're going to have to play test the heck out of it because you don't want players to have the game abruptly end and you don't want the player to. Uh, lose when they think they had a chance yeah. either. And we have to even decide whether the alien players can even win through that. Like, remember in 2012 when Gauss Sip 3 designed, everything was about balance. Yeah. And it's like, ugh, you know, it's a, no, it's about whether the player's having a good time. That is the metric, not balance. Yeah. Balance is a mechanism to get to having a good time, but it's not the only one. Well, it doesn't I, work well in single player, I don't think. I hate the word balance when it comes to single player games. Yeah, it's like don't you know the AI is not offended. They're not writing the AI. When as soon as the AI gets starts writing Steam reviews, then I'm going to care. <laughs> That's probably not far off though, <laughs> and it probably is going to be one of your AIs, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'll be a bunch of. I loved it. It was better than Cats. I will play it again and again. 
now you said that i think pretty much about 50 percent of the steam reviews have been written by that ai bot yeah <laughs> so brad can you tell me a little bit more about how different how different galaxy 4 is going to be from galaxy 3 like what else are you guys looking to implement that's going to kind of adhere to your your gaming philosophy of you know asymmetry and trying to make the game a bit more fun i, I mean in some ways it's easier to think about what's still the same i mean i guess in the same on the same side it's it's you still have freeform movement right that's kind of the thing that people like but like even ship design has been changed like um in gal civ 3 you know you if you want to design a ship you basically had to just go and design the ship right i mean like even the cosmetic part whereas in gal civ 4 the ship cosmetic part is external to the game and you can you can import an existing thing but you're basically just taking a ship and art and you can arm it then you know you equip the equip and the design are separate so you the design is outside the game and the equip the design is now in the game so even that part is somewhat different because it's just like it's just too much to ask for a player oh so you want a new ship well here you go here's the designer start drawing like whoa right now i mean i know there's fans who like love that part and that's fine do that do it external to the game it's not a problem but but asking the average player to do that but that's a you know, so pretty much everything has been changed. I'm trying to think of like uh, other stuff that's. I would need to, more specific like areas that you're looking for because, like <laughs> I said, it's so other than free form. Because uh, even the economy is completely different. How does research resource economy to uh, work in this one? Yeah, so you're, every planet is now rated on terms of how many minerals, tech. Uh, food, you know, uh, fertility or whatever you want to call it. I don't know. I, I forgot what we're calling it. We change the word all the time because everyone hates calling it food, but I think we ended up calling it food. Um, so wealth and culture. And then it's what you do with that on the planet. So you get other things, other planets, colonies can feed into that. And then you have on your planet actual citizens. So, for example, in all the other Gauss of games, you, we always f had a problem with this too because we were like, how many people are on this planet? You know, it would say 7.2 billion or 7.2 B, right? It's like, really? Are you planning a billion people on a, on a colony ship? That's a big ship. Um, this time around, it's like, it's, it's, we've just said, you know what? I don't care about realism in a sense. They're citizens. You, they are, you know, if, instead of a population of 2.2 B, it would just be, you'd have two, it would just show two citizens. And then, you know, actual characters, right? They're each with their own name and their own picture. Yeah, you're going to talk about artwork costs. Uh, <laughs> right? Because it, it would be, like, at one point, we're going to have them all be the same picture. Like, no, 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 no. I don't want to be looking at that picture for the rest of the game. Not to mention, given where we are as a society, today, I'm just... Like well, we're like, well, we'll make one a, well, but have male and female. It's like, yeah, what they're, they're all going to, anyway, I don't want to get into that. But <laughs> all, you know, just they a very wide variety of characters, right, show up on the screen as citizens. And, uh, but you know, say, like, you're 20 turns until your next, you know, citizen is spawned on that planet, which is the population growth. Then you can specify, well, what kind of citizen is it? This is kind of goes back to the, all the way back to Civilization 1, if you can remember that game, where you could literally select a guy and like, well, he's a scientist and he's an entertainer and he's a blah, blah, blah. Well, except we have a lot more and you can unlock a lot more on there. And um, and again, each of these people has their own stats. So when you're managing one of these planets, you're really managing that planet. It's a little bit more intensive than in Gauss of 3, but you don't have nearly as many. So it's it's okay. So the resources go there, and then on the planet itself, you have districts. So uh, the on the planet itself, if it's boy, it's completely different. Um, you have you have the tiles on the planet with adjacency and stuff, but you can put districts on there, like manufacturing district, research district, uh, financial district, and those are kind of like you know they 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 take your resources and modify them. But that's you can just do that anywhere, and then you have a handful of buildings that you place, and you literally drag and drop them where you want. And they're the things that really pump up the adjacencies. And there's a lot of drag and drop actually in this game. I don't know if did, I don't. I think Gauss. I don't think Gauss of three really had any drag and drop, did it? I guess you could drag and drop the order in which things were being built. But in this, you literally have to drag and drop. There's a. It's a, in some places. 
but yeah, you drag and drop your the like your technological capital onto a spot on the map on your planet, and then everything magnifies that. Well, with that being said, are, are there strategic resources too? I mean, are like with Galsiv three when you guys introduced Crusade, you you kind of really focused on the the strategic resources and. My God, you're right. We didn't have that in the base game, did we? I I don't I don't, I don't remember the base, base game, game at this point. <laughs> I just, I don't remember the base game that well. But when with Crusade yeah. though, I think you guys did a really good job of making things kind of gated in some way behind strategic resources, which I think Distant Worlds does very well too. But. Uh, you know, is is there some sort of system like that here with Galsa 4? Yeah, you still have that. And, you know, the way we gate it is we, we go, you can have the cheap thing without the, the fancy resource. There's almost always some crappy thing. But, like, they're using those buildings example. You don't need those buildings for your, you know, the function. But, boy, it sure is, would be nice to have those fun, those buildings. But you need, um, you know, Promethean, to, you know, to to actually build, construct it on the planet. That's awesome. There's a lot of stuff in the game like that too, where you're like, "Oh, I really just need a little bit of Promethean or a little bit of Thule." I can't remember Thurlon Thule. I, I don't remember the uh, the one that starts with TH, which is terrible because I came up with the names back in the day. Thulean, Thulean, yeah, yeah. Thulean. yeah. <laughs> well, so that actually leads me to my next question. I'm sorry if I don't know if you were about to say something, Ben, but the so part of what what I think is great about those kind of resources is that they create tension between you and your neighbors when, you know, those strategic resources are low in, low in supply and high in demand. Right. And the one thing I didn't like about Gauss of three was that it was pretty easy to just say like, Hey, I want some of your stuff. Right. And most of the time diplomacy worked out well for you. So with that, are there changes to the diplomacy system at all period? And then second of all, like, how are you kind of, balancing that with some of the like the strategic resources and stuff like that or text and all that stuff that you know a lot of people will cheese and stuff to get you know ahead and everything yeah so there's a there's a few things that we're doing with diplomacy and it has more to do with gating um based on your it, your diplomacy skill that determines how much you can actually trade at a given time we also have this concept called uh threatening and uh persuading so there's a new resource that your civ can get based on your own interior stats for generating it called like political capital. And you can use that sort of stuff as almost like a resource itself to kind of balance the tilt. One of the things that people didn't realize in Gauss Civ 3, for example, is that when they go in there and they would see, well, this trade isn't fair. Why is AI stupid? And like, well, no, what's actually happened is that behind the scenes, that AI's diplomatic ability is way better than yours. Well, that... That doesn't. That's not explained on the screen. So all the human player sees is a really stupid AI trade, right? Like, I'm, why would I give you? Why? Why am I being expected to hand you nine of my texts for one of yours? So this time around, rather than having that kind of stuff, uh, you have this capital stuff that you can literally put in as a res as a trade resource to them, and that, to balance things out. And doing that kind of thing it makes the game, I think, feel a lot better, as well as. Uh, how often you can trade and how much you can trade at a given time is based on these skills. So you can't just go in there and go, I'm going to put 500 things on here. Right. And not you have, and, and just go to town on them. It's like, no, no, no. Your skill determines the overall value of the package uh, that can be traded in a given time, their skill and your skill. So at the beginning, you can only do really little trades. So you can't, in other words, to answer the original question, I can't just go in there and say, well, I'm going to give you a bunch of shitty old, or, sorry, a bunch of junky old ships for all of your, pro, all of your Durantium, right? Which is what I did all the time in Galsip 3, and I didn't fix it, which I probably could have because I wrote that. But anyway, uh, but because it, it is easy that way. But in this case, there's an overall value of the trade. Right? It's kind of like when you go for a car loan, right? It's like you can only, there, there's, only a certain size of sign-off value you can get into with a loan officer. Is Does that make um, any sense to you guys? I think so. It we just have to. Figure, we haven't figured out a way to communicate to the player, but we have to communicate. Like the value of this trade overall is n units of credits, right? Overall or n whatever, and your technical, your trading ability, your the lowest kind of number between the two is this. Therefore, this is the maximum size of the trade you can do. 
in Fallen Enchantress, you had a kind of you had a kind of numeric system for for trading technology. So the the, the tech tree was split into. I'm talking about legendary heroes because um, that's the only one that I played. But you have uh, the the three branches of the tech tree were had their own kind of currency assigned, and I really liked that system. I actually thought the diplomacy in Fallen Enchantress was really good because I, I knew exactly what I was getting. You know, I would be like, okay, I'm going to trade you twenty points of this particular type of research for x amount of gold or for oh, right right or... right yeah, i so, remember yeah, that yeah yeah right and I, I i actually think that that's well, instead of, of trading best... tech maybe you know, uh, well right now we don't have that but that's actually not a bad idea because you could instead of researching tech i mean researching you know trading phasers for for farming space farming it would be you're trading a certain amount for this tech tree you know, of points in this area yeah right yeah, that's and that's how it that's how it worked in Fallen Enchantress, and I really liked that. I actually thought that that was, I mean, we we explominate with we're, we're all three of us. It's the one game that we can all agree on that we really love is Fallen Enchantress. So we really like that game. Oh, I wish though, the sales of that game reflected. That. <laughs> I know, I know. Even though it's flawed, and it is flawed, it's not perfect. There's a lot of problems sure. with it. But, it, but um, that I, I actually think the diplomacy was quite engaging in it for that for that meaning. I don't think, I don't know if Rob agrees with me on this one particularly, but I seem to remember that being good. But anyway, um, maybe so. If you've got this kind of currency system that you're talking about. I'm actually um, taking notes. Like that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, maybe, I, I was going to ask I mean, if you were doing that because it looked like you were taking notes there. Yeah. Well, if 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 it's if the issue with Galsif Three was, you know, um, expectations from the player and that it, that what was going on under the scenes wasn't really being communicated, that might be one way of doing because people understand currency, right? <laughs> right. No, I like that. Um, it's certainly less gamey. I know it would probably make people a lot less annoyed about AI trading, right? Because that's the thing that usually frustrates people is the AI trading particular texts with each other. Yeah, well, speaking of technology too, I think that you mentioned that there is going to be some changing to the way technology works. Can you go into that a little bit? Yeah. Um, so f for one thing, the, the, the texts that you have available to you to research – are, you can't just go like so. We made the tree a lot wider than we did it in Gap. It's a lot bigger and a lot wider than it was before, and so that creates a problem. One problem, and that is, if you did the old style, well, here are all the available texts. Is that it would be pages of them, right? Eventually, because it gets it gets even in Gauss of three, it gets pretty obnoxious late game, right? It's like scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. And this, you only it, the game will pick five of available texts and you have to choose one of those five to research and some of them are more likely to show up than others now you can get technologies and policies and leaders and stuff that will let you that increase that number now you can go in there and say mm, i want you i don't want i don't like any of those five i don't want to be stuck with just that so there's a button that says okay well i'm going to inspire you to think of some more and it will re it will add it will pick a different set of five, but the cost for the those go up by ten percent now. And you can do it again. That's another ten percent. And you can keep doing it until you go, oh, there's the tech I wanted, but now it costs you know X amount more to do it. So oh, wow, another can of worms you've opened here. So I have two questions. One of which one of which is so like I I don't know how familiar you are with Sword of the Stars, but one of the things that the like forex fan base enjoyed most about sort of the stars was that it had a random element to its tech tree so each of its factions were like more weighted toward getting certain technologies which made them feel more asymmetric right so right. that that would be cool to see and i don't know if that's something you guys are doing but that's something we're doing and there are a bunch of techs that aren't in the tree per se Right, so there's a tech tree still under the cover, and you can. We're still we're still figuring out how to display it, which because it's going to look like a. Oh, you can imagine what this tech. Tree, it's going to be. It's going to look really ugly, <laughs> I guess. As you can there's just no way to to make this look pretty under the covers because it's you know every this tech leads to 15 things and and yeah, but um, there's also techs that just aren't in the tree, at all. They just come up randomly. You know, so there, there are certain prerequisites to make sure you don't like, here's the win the game tech. You don't have anything like that. <laughs> but um, they're not technically part of any tree. and Or they may require several different prerequisites. And they just rarely will pop up. And they're, 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 they can be race-specific for your, not just race-specific, but based on your ideology or based on these other things. And you just pop up there. And they may be very uncommon to come up. 
And All we, right. of course, have our foot on the scale of what techs actually come up every turn, you know, for your race. I, I know that those of you who are listening can't see my face expressions, but facial expressions, but I'm just getting more and more eager to play this game as you speak because... Well, mind, the alpha is still pretty primitive. Otherwise, we'd have an alpha. <laughs> but, uh... Well, I mean, so, like, I mean, that that's cool because, like, I don't know the plant series's name, but, like, if you had, like, maybe a, a random faction specific technology that was like photosynthesis two, where that specific, you know, technology allowed them to, you know, grow faster as a result of their ability to harvest or harness photosynthesis better or something like that. That stuff really gets me like it really just <laughs> like in my core as a Forex player that really just excites me. But the other question I had too was, you know, I don't know if you're I'm, I'm sure you are because you are part of Mohawk and have been, you know, very close with Mohawk. But they chose to do something similar with that in, in old worlds. And I really like that because it was giving you a choice, but they also gave you the choice to redraw. So like there was an opportunity if you just said like, Oh no, none of these technologies work for me. I'll that's just... what we have. That's the inspire button that, and where it makes it 10% more expensive. But then they get into that question like, well, the tech I wanted didn't, you know, didn't show up, but Oh my God! This one super rare, right? Well, legendary technology shows up because they actually look like cards, right, on the screen. And it's like this one legendary tech that I've have even seen before is here. Oh, I mean, you know, if I redraw, it's never going to show up again. Ah, uh, sounds cool. <clears throat> yeah, it's such a it's a great solution to the problem of what happens late game. Because you do, have, there will be players who won't like this. Absolutely, I mean, we're we're very cognizant of that, and I think there there's legitimate gripes on the whole. But I want to be able to just go down the tech tree in my particular build order and do my thing, right? I don't want to be relying on random dice on what shows up there. And I to that I say I I agree that uh, that that you may not like that, but that's where that's why we added the reroll thing, even if it's a ten percent cost. Um, you know, temp and temper it's like, well, what does that mean? If it takes eight moves, it's going to take or turns to get it. And my takes nine. Is that really that big of a deal? But you know, it's a little bit there. So you don't just keep fishing until you get some godlike whatever shows up. I was, I was busy typing that this is, this seems like a hodgepodge of great ideas from like every great Forex game. Like I, and well, I, you know, I steal from everything. <laughs> well, so. And that was something I wanted to talk about. Cause I, in your, your article for Explominate, you did say that you were just basically like looking at things that work with all the games and taking what you liked. And this seems like a really good middle ground between what I think is great about Stellaris's tech tree or old worlds, or even sort of the stars and making that system work for galactic civilizations. And man, like everything you say, it seems like you're just like, yeah. That, that's cool. Let's do that. Only, only in our way. <laughs> well, it's more like, you know, I mean, I've been playing these games for 30 years. Oh God, I'm old. Um, 30 years now. Right. And I like, Oh, you know, I know what they're trying to accomplish there. And if you do this and this, this would make it even you know more fun in this setting, you know, cause I mean, fundamentally the, the game core game loop of a galactic civilizations game is, Pretty, I'd like to think it's fairly unique. Um, so you know, you can't just take a oh a feature from Stellaris or Endless Space or Master Ryan and pop it in here per se. But you can look at it and go, I like that, and they're trying to solve this problem because you know, you designers. That's what we do. We sit back and go, this is the problem we're tr trying to solve in a way that's fun for the player. How can we do that here? Do you think it's fair to say that 4X games in general have been kind of stuck in a bit of a rut for the last decade or so? Because that's certainly my impression. There are, Galsiv's always always done its own thing. And it's, I think it's always been kind of considered a bit more of a hardcore space 4X, really, when it's compared to things like Endless Space and that kind of stuff. Uh, do you think that Galsiv can continue to kind of forge its own path in that respect and diverge from this kind of, kind of vanilla sort of 4X experience that we've been getting recently? Well, I think all the games are actually improving, not just Gaussiv. I would say that pro that Gaussiv, you know, Gaussiv three was the problem with Gaussiv three is that it wasn't hardcore enough to satisfy the really hardcore, and it was, but it was still too hardcore 
to satisfy like you know the the let's say the the ca- more casual thing. So it was a, trying to be all things to all people. I, I mentioned that in the, in the article. It's like yeah, you know, in 2012 there was no endless space two. There was no Stellaris. There was so we were like okay, well we need to make this game so we have you know we appeal to a larger base and stuff. So in terms of you know. I've always, I guess the one feature I've been surprised in other games, I kind of understand why they do it, but I'm really always surprised by the phase lane thing, that everyone is pretty much always does the phase phase lane or whatever they're called. And the, I don't know what they're called in Stellaris or in Endless Space, but you know, the, the lines between stars, the Master Ryan. The node-based The node-based thing. Node base thing. Yeah. And I, I actually I like, like I understand why they do do it, but it's like, well, gosh, it's, there's so many other ways to do it. That's what drew me to Galsib in the first place. So it's not so noticeable in um, in Massive Orion somehow, um, but I don't like the endless space very much because it really feels on rails. And I know that uh, as you get through the game, there's certain texts open up to kind of like move you away from that. But that was really that really put me off endless space. And I think that's one of the draws of Galsib for me was that you just felt like you've got more control in, in a sense. Yeah, well, we were pretty worried that when people look at the screenshots and go, oh no, they're banning the freeform movement. They're going to node base. It's like, no, 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 no. Each of those things is actually a map. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that actually brings up my next question too, because I want to know how it is you tra- you you basically move from one of those maps, so like at one of those nodes or sectors, I think you called them. How do, how do you move from a sector to sector? Is there a star lane or some sort of thing like that? Yeah, we call it a subspace stream. It's like a wormhole. People have been asking for wormholes forever in Galaxy. It's like, okay, well, here's your wormhole from point A that goes from here to here. All we do instead, though, is we actually tell you where it's going to put, take you as opposed to, uh, you know, off you go. <laughs> well, is there – so with that, like, okay, so you're moving you, – you, you sh- you're sending your ships to through a wormhole and you make it to your next sector. I mean, is that just a whole new sector to explore, a whole new sector to, to learn about? It is. Oh, man. Yeah, so you can <laughs> imagine what's uh, – there's and there's an interesting benefit. Another benefit from a programming, but not programming, a hardware point of view, is that because you could say, well, why not just make it one giant map with clusters around, with with hypergates connecting? And the answer is, you know, every tile does use memory, and people go, well, how many tiles? Because I think, I think we figured out that there's like seven hundred thousand tiles, or some crazy number of tiles in a in a large calcium game. I don't remember the exact number, but you wouldn't think it adds up a lot. But it's like you're talking hundreds of megabytes of dead space being used by this stuff. Not to mention the pathfinding, right? Like, mm-hmm. think of the pathfinding. If you're moving it to a, another star in a Gaussian mega map, right? Let's say one of those crazy large maps, and there's literally 800 tiles do you know what's involved in a pathfinding for 800 tiles and then you have 10,000 ships each doing that every turn yeah i'm doing a cs degree so I'm, i've got some idea of how difficult that is <laughs> yeah i mean well programmatically it's easy but it's, <laughs> but from a performance point of view especially in a game where it's turn-based right so you're you can't i can't just calculate all these turn you know all this stuff behind because it changes so this lets us have like gargantuan sized galaxies without the the turn kill turn hit kill and not to mention who is it fun to travel i mean rob you've played a lot of gaussian 3 is it fun to send fleets flying through 300 tiles of blank no no (laughs) no (laughs) it's funny because gaussian 3 was that was the first game that i played where you if you wanted to play on a large map, you needed more than eight gigabyte of RAM. And yeah. that, there, there, there weren't any, because I, I, I got Galsiv 3 when it was released. It was, um, it was one of the first 4X games I bought after I got back into video gaming after a long hiatus. I think I bought Endless Legend first, actually. But, and I quite liked Galsiv 3. I thought it was good. I didn't play it a whole lot, i got to be honest. So it obviously wasn't that good, but it was, I seem to remember having fun with it. But I remember being um, impressed that if you wanted to play on a large map, you needed a decent amount of RAM. And it was, it was one of the only games that I had that actually used all of the RAM on my PC. <laughs> and all your cores. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that pathfinding stuff for all the AI, that, was, that is intense stuff. Well, and yet the game still got one of the better AIs in a 4X game. I mean... Galsiv 3 kicks my ass. <laughs> well, we try to make the computer players play like a human. I mean, I've spent thousands of hours 
on on the AI. And um, when is it? Computer, stop! I said the magic word. And uh, <laughs> and uh, it, yeah, it, it's you know they're trying to make sure the AI plays intelligent. It's nice because you know I get to bring that stuff because in Galaxy Three I had to write it from scratch. It was completely new. And in here, I get to bring a lot of that, the underlying libraries back with me. Would you say that uh, developing the AI in tandem with the game design is important? Because this is something we were talking about with Chris, uh, Chris Park, or the artist formerly known as Chris Park, uh, who is a member of Arkham Games, or the, the lead designer of Arkham Games, who made AI War. And he was saying that he thinks one of the problems with, uh, just to backtrack a little, for, uh, 4X fans often complain about AI in these games, and perhaps... A little unfairly because they're not always aware i don't think about how difficult it is to make an ai for such a complicated game but he was saying that he thinks that maybe if developers started the ai development a little bit earlier on in the design process that that might be part of the issue because some of the games with a better ai are often made by people with ai specialities like civ 4 soren johnson is an ai specialist i understand and that that's got good ai i thought i thought this, yeah. the ai in civ 4 was really good and your games have always had really, really good AI as well. At least the Galsiv games. Um, yeah, is that is that something that you've been kind of trying to prog- cook into the game early on? Yeah, I mean, like in Galsiv three, since I didn't design it, I was coming in after the fact, trying to up and make a good AI. It's like, oh my god, you have all this stuff here that is like really hard to solve for the for an AI to and for it to do do it well. I mean, eventually, you know, it got to be pretty good, but Gaussip 2, I designed the AI with the game, you know, along the way. And it's the same thing with Gaussip 4, where a lot of these features, as you play, as you think about them, you go, hey, you know, that actually works out pretty good for the AI, right? <laughs> and uh, let me give you an example. That's something that makes the game better for players, but makes it really great for the AI. So Colonies, like one of the most tedious parts of Gaussian games, and this goes back all the way to the OS2 version, is that invading a planet meet requires a transport, right? So it's a two-step process, and it makes sense. And it's a, but boy, it is really hard for the AI to coordinate that, right, sort of stuff. But in Gaussian four, colonies don't require a transport to to take over. And you can imagine why, right? If I have two hundred, if if the Drengen Empire has two hundred colonies. Can you imagine the just the tedium of having to conquer two hundred planet two two hundred class one planets or whatever? I mean that would suck. So I, if they, if there's no one in orbit, once you get rid of the orbital defenses, your ship, your little you know fighter, can take over a, a colony. So that makes it way easier for the AI. Now the core worlds, they're a different matter. You still have to have a transport and invade them. And it's like you know a full on like laying a it's like a laying siege in in uh, Crusader Kings three right it's a process, hmm. um, but you don't have that many core worlds, so it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, it sounds awesome. I think that's something that a few other games have done, and I think that sounds like a better a better solution. And I yeah. I'm telling you, man. Yeah. Brad, well, you're gonna have, but you're going to have someone who's going to complain, like, oh, they dumbed down the games. Like, no. Because you know, we're not requiring the transports for the, for just the colonies. And like I said, it's like, can you picture having to invade 300 colonies? Do you think that would be fun? Yeah. yeah well, Master of Orion did it like that. It, they, you just sent you sent colony tra- you just sent transports, and it was a it's an easy thing. Yeah. So you know they, they they had their own unique way of doing it, which people still complain about. <laughs> yeah, and you couldn't stop that transport. I don't think. I mean, it's just bup, bup, no, bup, 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 right. It's just coming. Yep. So well, okay. you just made an alliance with one of your enemies, and the transport lands. <laughs> then you I remember that. Again. Well, okay. I still remember, like, oh, everyone's at the end of that of Master Iron One. It was always sixty-five, five thirty-five fleet size fleets, but because there was either a bug or something had happened. <laughs> well, so you mentioned it, Brad, and I want to talk about it because, so in my defense, for my reexamination. When I talked about tactical battles for galactic civilization, no, no, no hear me out. It's I, okay. <laughs> I hear me out. So I think you guys did an amazing job with the the uh, fallen enchantress games, where you were able to implement a tactical battle battle system that did not take away from the game. It was quick, it was fun, it did feel tactical, and it was it was over 
fast enough that you didn't feel like you were being taken away from what your, your grander strategies were. So I imagine that as something that could have been implemented in galactic civilizations, because if, if you could figure out a way to make a game or the battles fast and quick and tactical like that, I would be all about it. But with it's that the quantity of battles, I mean, I wrote the AI, I literally wrote the tech way after both fallen enchantress and sorcerer King. I mean, like the actual C code there and all, and I, and I do enjoy it. The problem is like, even in those games, the number of those such battles, isn't that many compared to a, say a big gal Civ game where I might in a given turn, late game have 40 or 50 battles. Whereas you're never going to have that. In Fallen Enchantress or in Sorcerer King, you never, I know you never did because we, we would you get the memory fragmentation issue. We had to <laughs> keep the size of the maps down. So, um, you know, if Gaussip was a smaller game, because even Master Ryan, if you think, well, how many, what's the biggest, how many stars are in a max? 100. You know, 100, I think, on the original. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's 100. Yeah, it's 100. 90 or 100. 100, you know, most. And, and, you're just not going to have that many battles in in Master Ryan, whereas in Gauss, it's just it's just a quantity thing. If it weren't so many, I would love to do that. Besides, you know, there's always sins with Solar Empire for people who want that kind of combat. <laughs> well, so then combat then. And like, what kind of input are we going to have with combat? Is it the same as before where you were just, you know, most of the strategy or most of the tactics really goes into the the what you do before the battle? Or are there going to be some sort of orders that we can provide or something like that? The answer on that is it's not decided yet. Derek, uh, who's lead designer on Gaussian 4, and I are still talking about that in terms of what you do. Because there's a sense of having uh, flagships and commanders and upgrades that allow you to you make your ship, but then you can basically set their stance uh, before that amplifies some aspect of it. And, and because turns are multi-turn now, you also have bring into the fact that other fleets might now join the battle. And so that's going to be something during early access that we're going to have to see how that works. And I know that we've even played around the idea of having, uh, cause we really like this in, um, in Soren's game that, uh, you have, you know, in uh, old world, there's some really interesting on the map, like multi, you know, the number of t distance, uh, you can have things that are a couple tiles away engage in the battle, which is kind of fun. I don't know if it's still that way, but it was that way when I was playing it. Do you think there's some way to get some kind of um, player agency and interaction in the battles without it becoming a tactical battle? You know, like for example, I'm a big fan of the Dominions games, and um, the, the Dominions games you set your armies up at the start, and then you watch them go. And then they, you know, they fight the tactical battle out, but you don't have any input in it after that. That's actually quite fun. That would be way too much for Galsiv, I think. But is it? Is there like some kind of halfway way you could go with? Well, that's where like... setting up the the your stance yeah. at the beginning uh, for your fleet. What kind of? So you make your fleet, and then you basically say, well, this fleet, based on what how I put it together, is going to operate in this way, and that yeah. will determine how it works in battle. Um, but I know that it's it's still. It, you know, fuzzy enough that we haven't decided exactly how it's going to ultimately do because we're not sure yet the gameplay effect of having battles be multi-turn yet are is going to end up being yeah that was an issue i always had with like endless space or endless space 2 is that you would go through this battle and you didn't really know exactly why things ex came out the way they did so you know in as a plea really i would say that you know i, I would hope that you guys would consider some sort of after action report that helps me understand why things happened the way they did, because it always bothers me when I'm like, Oh cool. I lost that. I had overwhelming numbers. I had pretty good technology. What happened? And you know, whatever. Well, that's where the AR comes in this time. So in Gauss four, this is going to be a little weird for people coming from Gauss three, but you get into a battle. There's no screen at all. Um, you get into a battle. It happens. There's no confirmation. Instead, after the round, after, you get an after action report that shows up on the screen as a little icon. And if you click on that, that lets the player go into agonizing detail exactly what happened. But this lets us have our cake and eat it too, right? Because can you imagine if you're a new player, you get it and you get this incredibly detailed, like what happened in the battle thing by default. It's like, oh my God. And especially if it's every single battle, right? You imagine late game where there's, or even mid game where there's eight battles in a row. 
and you're like, oh my god, it's it, uh, what? Uh, there's all these screens that come are flashing at me. Here, it's like there's an icon that shows up on the left. You click on it, it brings this up. You can either review the battle exactly as it happened and with the cool you know, stuff, and see in extreme detail how the different systems worked against each other and you know up to and this is where i a lot of the flavor comes in because i really want them to be more like pretty story yeah and i don't want to be written like a debug log i want it to be uh get us i want us to get back to where it's uh the you know the the errington mark four missile you know with 52 ki kilojoules you know impacted on the you know you know, armor of the TAS, you know, blah, 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 doing 44 points of structural damage, 13 of which was mitigated by it, the, um, you know, no point Mark V armor. I know it's like super grognardy, but I mean, it's one no, of those, no, no, really, if the player tight. wants to know about that, I think they should get to find out about exactly what happened. Whereas yeah. in Galaxy 3, you know, when you say the after action report, whatever we call it, the, the summer report, it's a, such a clear example of trying to be all things to all people. We go, well, we're going to show this after every battle, so we better not show too much stuff. So, well, yeah, but now you, you're, you're not showing enough, you're showing too much stuff for the guy who just wants to play the game. But not nearly enough stuff for the guy who's interested in this stuff. Yeah. yeah, that was actually where I was kind of headed to is that like with Gladiator Civilizations 3's like after action report, I felt like it was just, they were just numbers. That's all they were. And, you know, like missile hit for 15. And you're like, well, That's damage. Right. Ooh, whatever that means. <laughs> well, and then, yeah, like why, why did it hit for 15 damage? Is it because it was mitigated by, I don't know. So, yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear see, uh, the idea that you're throwing around. It sounds great. So I'm really excited. Are you are you better? I'm getting excited. I, I don't get. <laughs> I want to point out that the alpha is not going to be like anyone who's thinking that they're going to get the alpha and have all this cool stuff. It's like, let me put it this way: in the alpha, you can only play it. You can only play as a humans again. Yeah, yeah. I'm out. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no, so that's... We're, we're, like it's going to be. So yeah, it's, it's it's we have a long road away ahead of us from from where we are right now to final release and. uh but yeah, that you, but it, all this stuff is in progress, and will will be in before release. So someone can go like, "Hey, you said in that, that, that it was going to have that." It's like, yeah, that's why I'm making it. I'm on the record. <laughs> <laughs> well, and yeah. it's all subject to change, right? Like you, under, from what I saw in your post, like anything could be thrown out at any point because you guys finally get it in the hands of people, and you know you've realized, hey, you know what, that after action report is not fun at all for 99 percent of people. I really want that stuff in there. I, I mean, <laughs> one of the big. I want this game to be a game because I, I end up playing, having to play the game, and I want this stuff. I it really pains me, like. I was the one in Gauss of 2 that went in and named every weapon. Like, if you go in Gauss of 2 and you play as the Altarians, for example, every weapon system and every ship system had its own Altarian style to it. It was like the discouraging amplifier, you know, all, like really passive aggressive names for the weapon. It's like mm. not gentle kindness, you know, Mark, <laughs> you know, version 3.2. <laughs> <laughs> that's, well, that's really funny. You're talking about Gauss of 2. <clears throat> I was interested to read that some of the uh, technological innovations that were in your previous games ended up having some unforeseen uh, advantages later down the line. For example, with Galsiv 2, uh, the the fact that it it actually it doesn't scale to the UI is that right? So um, you can actually play that game now with a with a 4K monitor and it it's, still looks it's, good. Uh, it's uh, yeah, it's resolution uh, independent. Yeah, sure. Right. Okay. Uh, would you say that Stardock's experience in tools and user interface technology like that? Because I know that you do a lot of stuff for for Windows and you know, kind of UI stuff. Do you think that gives Stardock a bit of an advantage over other developers who might be sort of more f focused solely on video games de design itself? Well, traditionally it has. I mean, that was certainly one example. If you actually make user interface tools for companies, and they have to be resolution independent, um, you know, you go and make a game and use your own tech. That was a big thing, right? You're not stuck yeah. with, I mean, the fact that you can load up Gal. Now, the only thing that is weird because it's uh, all the UI was, we didn't know about 16 by 9 monitors back in those days. So things are a little bit like weird proportion, but they're not, they don't look stretched, mm -hmm. right? That's where you can really tell that it's not just scaling it, right? It's because it was made for a 4 by 3 and you're playing a 6 by 9 and it's not, you know, the textures aren't all stretched out or anything right. like that. Um well, so, I mean, go ahead. 
No, I was going to say that that was the weird thing that I, re- I realized when we, well, so I don't know, I think we've touched base about this, but we made a top 10 Forex games of all time list, which of course was super controversial because we like controversy. And we had Galactic Civilizations 2 on that list. And with that that process of making the video and making the list, we went. I wanted to go back and, and play the game and, and use some footage for that. And it fired up perfectly fine on my 1440p monitor. And I was like, wait, hold up a second. How is this? And then I realized that it just, it looked good and it's 15 years old now. It's just, crazy. yeah. If it weren't for the four by three thing, it would be like, you should picture it had the bottom, you, you know, a bottom bar. Right. And you can go like, well, that doesn't hold up nowadays, but from a, from an aesthetics point of view, but yeah, it, I mean, it plays uh, really, it plays real well. Um, I don't know if I, I think at this stage though, I, I do think Gauss of three is the better game, but it, you know, it should be after all these years and all the, but it, in terms of like when Gauss of three shipped versus Gauss of two at the end, it was, it would be no. So Gauss of two does not have the supply, those supply ships, for example, like <laughs> I can't live without those. Well, so yeah. what we, what we tried to base our our list on was the innovative factor. Like there was, there was a lot of consideration, a lot of weight given to games that kind of paved the way for some of the newer games nowadays. So we thought that Galsif 2 had a better or a bigger impact on the genre itself than maybe necessarily Galsif 3. Well, definitely. I mean, Galsif 3, you know, like I said, I mean, I've been critical. I'm over too critical. It's not fair, right? To the, it's not fair to the team, then, especially since it's my own company. It's ultimately my fault. Well, and I, like I say, like the game was, a, the game does have an 81 Metacritic and and sold millions of copies, so <laughs> it can't be too hard on it. It's just, I'm like, uh, you know, I started out on Usenet back in the day, so I was one of those loud mouths on Usenet. So I haven't really fully grown out of that. It's just one of those, but it wasn't my game. It wasn't the type of game I generally, I you know. Especially the the base game. When you, if you want to see the game, I, I mean, Crusade was when I got involved, and I was able to. I made it more like how I wanted to play. Um, but yeah, in terms of innovation, I mean, really, yeah, Gaussian Two had all. I mean, Gaussian Two was the first uh, multi-core aware game. You know, we take it for granted now, but in two thousand six, I mean, a game that could make take advantage of SMP multi-processing or hyper-threading and all this other stuff. Yeah, this is what I was getting at. It's like you, you, you've always, obviously, you've got, you know, one foot in the non-gaming side of tech as well. So, you know, you've been kind of looking ahead to see where, where technology is going to be. Um, which engine are you using for Galaxy 4? Is it is it the Galaxy Galactic Engine? Yeah, it's, still the, it's a Galactic Engine. So it's still yep. using the Galaxy 3 because that was so, oh, my God. If you're like for, you said you're in computer science, right? The... I, I'm doing a computer science related degree. It's pretty much. So in Gauss Civ four, I can literally just take a function and and call it with a parameter, and it spins it off into a job. You don't right. like for setting up multi threading and multi. It it sends it off to the to the core, the least busy core, and it just does it. I mean, mm-hmm. so much about good performance is also about making it easy for the developer to use the goodies. Right? It doesn't matter how. Remember the old uh, PlayStation two or three with the cell processors and had all this power, but no one used it because it was too hard to use. Or like yeah. the nice thing with the Galactic engine is like, oh, I really need to go and do a search on this. Well, go go do that and I'll continue and it will send me a message when it's done. No, oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And on, on that topic, Brad, and I, I know we have to kind of wrap things up here, but I am curious to know like what your, your opinions or maybe your projections or whatever you want to call them would be on the future of gaming technology in general, because I know you are, you have your ear to the ground with a lot of it. And I'm curious to know, like, where do you see, like things have changed in 15 years dramatically, really. And I'm curious to know what you think maybe would be the standard of AI performance or AI development and game development in like 10 years or so. Well, it's getting better and better. I mean, you're going to definitely have your own that stuff. I mean, going into future games are, I don't know. We won't be able to do it in Gauss at four, but you know, in Gauss at five, you'd probably have some neural networking in. Um, I know Gauss at three had a little bit of where we had metadata analytics from the game that could be shared, so we found out. Oh, this is how everyone's researching the tech tree. Well, we should have the AI do that. Um, I wish we had done that on ship designs. 
uh, that's something I'd like to uh, get do better. See, done made use of because Galaxy benefits more so than most games from that kind of thing, right? If the if the AI's designed ships are based on on uh, you know some sort of basic expert system where it's or even like just uh, deep learning where it's hey the AI this is what this is how um, ten thousand or a hundred thousand Galaxy players design their ships. These are the ones that are most successful. Build that ship. <laughs> Because yeah. right? that takes me out of the loop. I don't have to do any work, right? Because yeah. I'm just I'm just using the best ships that people are building. Is it? Uh, oh, I think cost... that's where it's going to go. Go ahead. Sorry, is it? Uh, is the thing that's preventing machine learning being used utilized more in game development? Is it a cost thing? And I mean, kind of processing cost and development cost. Um, is that is that what's stopping it at the moment? Is it just too too cost intensive? It's the, just the upfront development cost on this yeah. is that as a practical matter, most people are not good. To, this is, gets into the stats of the people who are online versus the people who play, right? It's uh, There are people who will appreciate. This is the thing I used to like be horrified when games cheated. Their AIs cheated, right? And everyone says, oh, I hate cheating AI. Well, 99% of people don't give a crap, right? Mm -hmm. I only focus on and even, and even if you do it right they still say your ai it drives me crazy i read these stories like yeah, ai and gal sub three cheats and it's like no what game doesn't know what game what but, game AI but the AI isn't cheating that. it doesn't know where the good planets are it's yeah. like I, there are certain rules now that doesn't say there aren't certain rules and ways the gal the stars are set up that i happen to know but the AI does not know where the planets are. Uh, but so it doesn't. Do, so even when you do it right, you don't get the the benefit. But the point is that there's this upfront cost to do it that way on a game that isn't going to have like a you know, what is the life cycle of one of these games? Five, six, seven years before you're doing. You really need to go and remake the next version. That's a pretty big upfront for a very short lifespan. Yeah, sure. Right. So. Brad, we're going to have to start wrapping things up here, but I, I was hoping you could tell us about your team because I understand it's kind of the who's who there at Starduck of like the the previous Gauss of Two and then like a lot of the people that were pretty integral in, in the forming of Starduck. Can you tell us a little about who's working on Gauss of Four? Sure. So uh, when I did get, did the Gauss of One for Windows back in 2003, uh, exactly 10 years after the OS2 version, I had two interns with me. I had hi uh, hired, because uh, again, we were really small at, at that time. And it was, uh, I had Carrie, who was an intern. And she had just, gra well, she had just graduated. No, she was still interning, and Scott. And then uh, for Galsip 2, I had Carrie and Scott. And then we added Jesse uh, joined us, and Sarah joined us, and Paul Boyer, who was, actually came from the desktop customization site. And, we, and then we had a guy named Joe, uh, who, uh, he's not with the company now, but we still talk to him. And he was on for Galsip 2. Then um, we did. We had. Uh, I had to take them off for the f demigod to f help f uh, solve demigod's issues. We are the publisher on that. A lot of people forget that, but not the developer. But uh, I mean, great game. Uh, I really like demigod, by the way. But we had to, it took a lot of support to get the multiplayer working on that game. But so I had Carrie and Scott and Jesse working on that, and then I I was working on Impulse. So when we did Gauss of three, I went, okay, well, I'm not going to be around. I'm going to be on uh, over in Maryland, down the road from you, on doing any occupied Mohawk stuff. But I have John Schaefer. So I hired John Schaefer, who had just finished Civilization V to do design. And uh, we hired a bunch of uh, people internally who would work on Gauss of three, new people. And they made Gauss of three. And uh, Paul took, when John left, uh, I, Paul uh, took over the um, design. And uh, so we made that, and then, but now for Gal and at that time, um, Carrie had gotten married, and she had a baby, and so she was off on maternity leave. And then there, I, the end of, for Retribution uh, around that time, Carrie came back, Sarah came back. Uh, Sarah take, had been working on um, what had Sarah been more Ashes of Singularity stuff, and then um, yeah, for so for Gauss at four, it's we're back to it's. Carrie and Sarah and Scott and Paul and Jesse and um, you know plus uh, some you know some new people and you know me and and then I have Derek who was Derek and I had collaborated on Fallen Enchantress and uh, Fallen Enchantress Legendary Heroes before. 
Right. And we actually interviewed Derek. And for those that aren't aware of Derek, of Derek Paxson, he's the, the former lead developer, I guess you could say, of the Fall From Heaven mods who are just, just gigantic mods and hugely popular mods for Civilization Four. And I mean, he's clearly very, very capable of game design. So you, you when you say all those names, it just sounds like you guys can't go wrong. And I don't want to, I don't want to jinx anything here, but it just feels like, unless you guys start button heads, which I don't think you do, it just seems like no. you guys will have the, a really solid product here. Yeah, I, I, we're pretty excited. I mean, we're and we're having a really good time. We get to sit around. And we we talk about, oh, wouldn't this be cool? And a big focus of this game is that we are making this for ourselves, and we hope other people want to play it. Um, and like I said, I, I feel like I bash Galaxy 3 too much, and I shouldn't. Because, it did, like I said, it's a successful game. People do like it. It got positive reviews. But, I mean, it was made – It's it was not – it was made for the people the, – our team that, that made it, they were good engineers, but they weren't making it for themselves. They're not – they weren't – other than maybe Paul, they weren't – you know, they're generally not 4X players. Whereas with Galaxy 4, you know, the, our, the team that's on there, they've collectively have – you know, 20 years of, of experience. I mean, not collectively, but individually, you know, 10, 15, 20 years of experience making these games and they play the game. So it will be interesting because it's going to be a lot less balanced. I mean, you're going to see people saying, why well, so-and-so is OP and like, yep. <laughs> yeah. Just, and it's like, him, my answer, you're going to see this a lot. You'll see someone say it's OP and like, yeah, you should probably set their difficulty lower. Right. I mean, that's, that's the answer. It's not like going to be, oh, well, they're all the abilities are equal. It's like, well, you know, you can set that up however you want. Uh, I'm getting excited now. <laughs> yeah, no, I, it's, I know that I'm, I'm somewhat unique in saying this, but I've always said that the balance was like the enemy of, of fun. And, you know, most of the games that I enjoy the most are just simply unbalanced. I mean, like, I know that Ben feels the same way. I mean, you go back and you play Master of Magic. That game is imbalanced as all hell. Yeah. And it's one of the most but fun it's, games. Yeah, it's, right. it's still a great game, right? And, you know, some of the games that I enjoyed the most out of the time that I've ever played 4X games or any game for that matter, I just, if you, unless you're playing a game that's like strictly multiplayer and very multiplayer focused, which I understand balance needs to be there for. But when sure. a game is played overwhelmingly single player, which I know Galactic Civilizations is, Balance is for the birds, man. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, like uh, in my, one of my favorite shows is Babylon 5, and you can see its influence in Galsip pretty heavily. And, uh, you know, the yeah, Mimbari right. are way more advanced than the humans. Yeah, where's, where's the balance oh, I hope someone lost her. I hope Jameis lost his job over that. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then you think they're, you think the Mimbari are tough. Then you have the Vorlons. Right? Yeah, the, the OP. Uh, what's, you yeah. you got to nerf them. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. I really like this. This has been a fantastic talk, really, Brad. I really, you know, like the things you've been saying. I mean, I know you're not inside my head, and I know that you and I have talked quite a bit, but not to the point where I think you understand exactly what I'm looking for in a forex game. And m much of what you've said is really something that I mean, a long time debate with, with me, Ben, and a lot of the group here at, at Explominate on the Discord and in forex gaming on the on the subreddit. We've just been. These are the kind of discussions we've had, and and the the things that you're saying kind of feel like they're just like ripping them, ripping right out of those discussions. <laughs> like, oh, oh, he, th these guys. Well, they are. <laughs> well, I mean, remember, I'm on, I'm on the on the your forums. I read your Steam stuff, and I, I'm on the Reddit, the subreddit every day, and uh, so you know, I'll be on there and like someone will post a thing. You know, I like to, I talk to uh, I think it's Ray Fowler. I, uh, right. Uh, Remnants of the Precursor. I talked to him, right? And like, oh, I've already told him, that, like, oh, here's the stuff I'm stealing from your game. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, you know, I, 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 I just, I want to make a game I want to play. Like, you know how many hours I have? I mean, I, I have so many hours into these, into get even the Galaxy Three, right? I even, and I had more in Galaxy Two. I, and uh, I want to be enjoy the game because I had to play it over and over and over and over. That's great. And it, it shows. I'm such really a great, excited. We have such a great community too, right? I mean, like, like you know, do you know how I got Crusader Kings 3? I, I imagine. Frederick gave yeah. it to me. I was about to say, Frederick probably. I know you guys have yeah. a pretty good relationship. Yeah. Like, we're friends with, like, it's like, oh, well, start off and Paradox. Like, we, lo we're, we love Paradox, right? I mean, they were our publisher on Galaxy 2 over in Europe, right? Mm -hmm. So we've always had, I mean, Frederick's been over before. It's, it's so... It's a great community where we don't see ourselves as competitors. We look at ourselves, we're more like allies, 
trying to <laughs> trying to get try to uh, we're we're on a we are on a crusade to get every gamer out there to play 4x games yes that's uh, our goal that's yes. that's what we're here to do join us right <laughs> yes yes i mean that's the whole reason we started exploring it is because we just wanted to feel we we thought that the 4x genre had a broader appeal than it really than it was seemingly showing right like i mean civilization is one of the biggest games on the planet and it's yeah. it's a 4x game and when you start to be like when you start telling people that online they're like wait this 4X genre, I've never heard of it. I'm like, sure you have. You, you play Civilization, right? You've heard of Civilization. They're like, yeah, well, that's yeah, a yeah, 4X yeah. game. Like, like you got to play them. There's so many. Not knowing what a MOBA is, right? I mean, right. Uh, 4X is a particular subgenre of strategy, just like MOBA is a particular sub-strategy of strategy as well. Yeah, exactly. We've been very hard on Stellaris, you know, and actually you can't argue with the sales figures and the amount of people who play it. It's, it's funny because... You know, I'm, well, I'm it's real time. Friends. That is the key to Stellaris, right? Is it is real time. I mean, I don't think turn-based games like now, barring Civ, and it'll be interesting to see how uh, Humankind does. I'll be very, very interested in that. Um, I've not got to play. I, I haven't got to play that uh, the beta of that. I don't know if it's available, but uh, the being real time is a huge advantage. You know, with Sins of a Solar Empire, it's real time. That is a big advantage uh, that these games, especially when it comes to the combat and the explosions and stuff like that. And Solaris delivers a lot of flavor. Yeah. You know, that a lot of, you know, the most games just can't. I think we're, because we're a little bit jaded, kind of 4X people who play a lot of 4X games, where it's it's gotten to the point with Solaris where we it's kind of easy for us to to find fault with it. But in that in that jaded nature, you, also, you it's quite easy to forget what's good about it as well. And you know, I, we might have been a bit unfair on Solaris in the past. <laughs> I think, but they, I mean, you yeah. can't deny it. it is a good game. It is a good yeah, game. yeah. For it sure. is well. It, it's one of those things you can't. The first impressions are hard to like if someone was introduced to if someone who had never played Galaxization, and you see we see this a lot goes and buys it today and plays it uh you know with what comes with it they would probably go well, i don't understand what this is this is fun this is really good mm-hmm. but if you if what's stuck in your head is how when it first came out it's like well it's really boring and there's not a lot to it and solaris was pretty rough when it came out yeah, it was and you know, if you remember, if people forget the reviews. I think it had like a 60 Metacritic or something, or there were a lot of 60s and high 50s. And I think even like quarter to three gave it like one one star. Um, and that, I mean, I don't, think, I don't think that was that was fair. But Tom can be rough. Um, but they have done so much since then. They've they've really listened. I mean, I'm not obviously I'm not. I don't mean to sound like a Paradox fanboy, but I I mean I really like what they do. They did. I, I pre- actually prefer Crusader Kings 3 to Stellaris. I would like to see Crusader Kings 3 in space. Uh, give me that game. Yes. Oh, that was an incredibly good game on release <laughs> as well. CK3 took us by surprise, didn't it, yeah. Rob? Yeah. Like we, we weren't ready for it. We were like, you know, kind of got used to Paradox having had a few shaky releases. Um, and they they blindsided us with the quality of uh, CK3 that was... That really, I, I think it really saved their reputation as well with the gaming community. It's a stunning release. It is. It is. I play like I have almost six hundred hours, I think, into that game. <laughs> I was just wow. about to say. No, so Brad and I are friends on Steam. I can see it pop up on my Steam, my Steam relay notifications, and it always is the you know Dragonals playing Crusader Kings three. I'm like, oh, uh, imagine that. <laughs> I'm researching. I'm, it's research. I assure you. <laughs> That's great stuff. Hey, Brad, I really appreciate you being on the show with us. You're really can- I love talking to you because first of all, you're super candid and you're really great to talk to. And, you know, I also really appreciate your input and your your insight on some of the stuff that's going on that we just don't know as gamers, you know, like we don't really know the, the, the developer's mindset sometimes. And it's good to hear what you have to say about all of that. So I really appreciate your time and, and being here. Thank you. Well, it's always good to talk to you guys. And of course, I'm always I'm on your I'm on your uh, Discord server. So, yes, you can I, always ping me there. <laughs> I paid him off. He came over. It's great. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, Brad, thanks again. And, you know, Ben, do you have anything else for him before we let him go? I know he's a busy man, but you, you got him one more. One more. Are you uh, what, what's happening with Elemental then, Brad? Is that is there anything? Oh, going gosh, I, I'm not presently, you know, after uh Gauss at four finishes, Derek gets to work on his fantasy four X game. Mm. Um that's my that's my carrot. 
Uh, mm. you know, for hey, Derek, <laughs> I need you to do Galaxy Four for me. Uh, then you can work on your fantasy forex game you want to make, which I not, but I definitely want to go back to element. I mean, I wrote a whole book. I have so much lore behind it, and it just I have the book killed by the got murdered by its engine. Yeah, yeah. no, and it's funny. I, a little behind the scenes here. I I've met Brad a few times in in real life, and I actually had him sign a copy of my collector's edition for Elemental. It's just <laughs> really? well, it was if we had the book. And yeah, it was great. It. it was fantastic. Yeah. I, but yeah, no, I you know it's funny because when you brought on Derek Paxson, I was almost certain you were bringing him over because you wanted Fall from Heaven, and I was like, oh cool, we're gonna get a Fall from Heaven, and it's been a while. Yeah, it's I give him a hard time. I was like, you've been here 10 years. Where's my fall from heaven game? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> awesome. Well, first you had me, like, fix Elemental. And yeah. then you had me do uh, help run a uh, deal with Off-World Trading Company and getting out the door. And then, yeah, he did Siege of Centauri. And now he's doing Gaussiv. But then he can do his uh, – I don't know what it will ultimately be called. You know, it's ironic, but people ask, well, why haven't you made a fall, Fallen Enchantress too? And it's like, you know – if it wasn't called Fallen Enchantress, we would totally have done that. If it had been called something else. Well, because Final they, Final Fantasy's gotten 17 remakes and, and sequels. No, but the problem is that if we're going to end up doing a game called Fall from Heaven, having it's confusing to have a Fallen Enchantress and a Fall from Heaven game. Yeah. I mean, it's bad enough we have Gauss, Civ, and Sins. At least they're different genres, kind of. Fall from Enchantress. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Has a since two been? Are we allowed to talk about that yet? <laughs> Is that no? Been... We're not allowed to talk about since two yet. But that <laughs> time will come. Yeah, there's there have been hints. I I know no, it's we'll there. Put that one out. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, I know he's he's. Well, I mean, I would I, just say that moves have been made to ensure that it will be a reality. Yeah, we'll we'll come back when that happens. But I mean, in the meantime, we have something extremely exciting in Galsiv Five Four. Good Lord, Five is I'm jumping ahead here. <laughs> Galsiv Four, and I, you know, I I rarely get very fanboyish, and I, I, I will say that when we had Eric Rutens on for Distant Worlds, I was also kind of you know frothing at the bit here, but I, I think well, I'm. Can you imagine what if he just had more resources oh. available to him, what he could do because he is really just so talented. Yeah, he and Elliot are are making a great game, I'm sure, and. Distant Worlds universe was amazing, but I mean, with what I've seen of Counts of Five and what you've said, I'm, I don't know, I, cool. I might be more excited for Gauss of Four. I keep saying Five. I well, like I said, keep your <laughs> uh, keep for you know anyone who's thinking, oh, I can't wait to get to Alpha. It's the reason why it's an Alpha because we're nervous, right? We're we're genuinely nervous because. Pure, no one's going to be saying this is Galsa 3 warmed over, right? It is very <laughs> different. And so some of the things we're doing, I, I suspect the players are going to get and go, yeah, that's uh, that didn't work out. Because there's, you know, the, not the broad stroke stuff, but see, you know, the, there's details and stuff that we we have to figure out if, if that's going to be fun or not. So people are going to be getting into the game. like, well, you can't only play. We're like, we're not going to have uh, policies in it. There's a whole bunch of features that want you to be enabled in the alpha. Not that I'm trying to tell people don't get the alpha, but don't get the alpha. Unless you're like, you want are a person who want, like, my role is to basically bitch, mostly internally. But that's what I, like, I've, I'm that guy where I have pages and pages of stuff of here's what we need to fix. And so if you're one of those people, then yeah, you, it might be for you. But otherwise, wait until it ships. All right. With that said, could you just plug it real quick? I mean, what are we looking at? We're looking at a summer alpha and a beta later this year. Uh, yeah, uh, alpha in June. So basically a month from now will be the alpha on gaussif4.com. And then... Uh, beta, well, it, it, it depends I, where you want to call it the beta or not, and then release some, hopefully sometime next year. Okay. Excellent. Well, like I said, really great to talk to you, Brad. Really appreciate it. And talk to you guys. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry that Ben had to throw that elemental stuff in there. <laughs> oh, I, I think about elemental every single day. <laughs> it's well, like, yeah. It's, I, there are so many people, you know, who like, I, I'm subscribed to the Elemental Steam uh, discussion group, and there's, I'm, I'm sure you see it as well, Brad, but every couple of days, or every, every, maybe once a week, there's someone who, on, who comes on there and goes, oh, I want this game, like, I want this game to be remade because this is the best, like, Fantasy 4X game. Well, and, we took out, well, you're talking about Fallen Chandras, but the original Elemental had dynasties. You could actually breed your children, and it would take on, like, you could actually breed it, like, an Altair or whatever, with a 
with a fallen and end up with a half breed and it would actually combine the textures and and the skeletal uh, to do all this I mean, and this is in 2009 god it was yeah, so yeah. awesome yeah they, they, you know like you would look at oh well, look what they're doing in crusader kings where they have the you know blah 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 but they're not doing it with basically aliens with each other no. yeah in 2009 it was uh, crazy i can't wait i know you guys will do it one day but i can't wait someday yeah well thanks again brad all right thanks again and this is rob Brad and Ben for Explominates. Until next time, keep exploring. All right. Yeah, see you later. Bye.